I want to start a series that if you're coming, thank you for being here. You won't want to miss the next few weeks because we're going to be talking really about how to seize an atmospheric transformation of Jesus. Now, let me just put it in modern day vernacular here. When Jesus shows up and he wants to do something, you've got an opportunity to receive that thing or reject that thing. Now, I've heard people say that if it's in the will of God, it'll just happen and they just do this fly by night. Just if it's in the will of God, whatever, whatever's supposed to be God will be God. Whatever's not is not. I get all that. But if that's the truth, then what are we praying for? We might as well just all sit back if everything's just going to automatically come to pass. And I'm going to show you in the word of God that the actions of people and how you respond to Jesus. How many felt God bumps before? How many think God's just giving you bumps to make you feel good and it doesn't require any action out of you? Okay, you would say no to that, hopefully. When God comes on you, he's drawing you. The scariest thing we can do is go, did you feel that? And then we just move on. Okay, we have to learn how to seize the atmospheric shift of Jesus Christ. So for a few moments, I want to talk to you about seeing what you could not see before. I'm going to say it again. Seeing what you could not see before. I'm going to open this text to you in just a moment. But I believe that the spirit of revelation is going to come upon your spiritual eyes. And you'll be able to see something that you couldn't see five minutes ago. Amen. That's the power of revelation and the presence of Jesus Christ. I did not sign up to just tell you Bible stories. I'm here because I believe that God wants to show up and give us revelation out of his word. And when revelation comes, his life comes into the atmosphere. So you may have come in here with a perspective. And here's what I'm charging and challenging every one of us. It doesn't matter if it's a battle you're going through. It doesn't matter if it's a sickness in your body. It doesn't matter if it's a family member, a job. It really doesn't matter. I'm asking Holy Spirit to move until you can see what you could not see before you walked into this room. How many believe that would be an awesome thing if God did that? In our lives. So Mark chapter 10, verse number 46. That's the wrong verse. <laughs> I, I think. Let's go backwards for just a moment. Mark chapter 10. Mark chapter 10. What is Let me read this to you. I want you to pray in Holy Spirit because I, I, I want to share about Bartimaeus but I'm sensing I want to read something along with that that, that I think is going to help us how many heard that story of blind Bartimaeus but I, 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 I feel and sense as, as we look at this next text that sometimes when you flip to something you got to go with it okay you got to go with them but, but that's part of these eyes opening up but I want you to pray right now that all blinders would come off because I think we're about to actually see something that we haven't seen before. And we've got to trust God. So if you can lift your voice just a little louder. I want to pray into this moment. I want to pray into this moment right now. Come Jesus. Keep praying. I'm asking God for a new perspective today on some things because our language will change when we get a new perspective. We were in Mark 10. Keep praying. But my Bible, I turned to Matthew 10. I don't want to read something, but I want you to just keep praying. Do not think that I came to bring peace in the earth. This is Matthew 10, and we'll read about blind Bartimaeus in just a moment. But listen to this. Do not think that I came to bring peace on the earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to set a man against his father, a daughter against the mother, a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and man's enemies will be those of his own household. Let me know that that's... It's crazy to think about this, but I want you to keep praying. And I'm not going to preach on it. I feel like I just need to read it. He who loves his father or mother more than me, he's not worthy of me. And he who loves a son or a daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he who does not take his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. 
He who finds his life, keep praying, will lose it. And he who loses his life for my sake will find it. Father, I pray for every lost soul that's in this house right now, God, before we deal with this revelation. God, I feel a Holy Spirit pause to address the idea that if we found our life and we're happy, but we're not faithful to you, we've lost it. And God, I say that over every person in this house right now. Those that are okay and have found their life outside of these four walls and are content with it, without Jesus Christ being the center, you say that we've lost it. But Lord, if we'll lose our life, we'll find it. But if we do not take our cross and follow you, we will never find you. So God, I'm asking you right now with just what's in Matthew 10, convict every heart in this room, God, that is not ready to meet Jesus Christ. God, I pray that your presence would come, your power would come, your conviction would come, Lord. But by the end of this service, they would recognize the love of the Father, Lord, that you came to separate them from this world. And there's no more fun than having fun with Jesus Christ. And I bind up every lie of the devil. And I say right now, let them see what they could not see before. That if they're happy without Jesus, it's a lie. And they're a candidate to be separated from you. In Jesus' name. Amen. I think we can move on. I just... I mean, we got to roll with it sometimes. I mean, we got to roll with it every time. Mark chapter 10. I'm going to read something to you. It's going to open something in your eyes. It's going to be, it's going to be powerful. How many heard the story? Wave at me. Okay. Some would call him Bartimaeus. Some would call him Bartimaeus. Don't get caught up in it. Bart, for all I can. Mark chapter 10, verse number 46. Now they came to Jericho as he went out of Jericho with his disciples and a great multitude. Blind Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus, sat by the road begging. Now how many has ever been there before? It's almost just like there's no hope in this thing. His issue was he needed some money. Okay, He needed some, some things happening in his life, but he had a bigger issue. Watch this. And when he heard that it was Jesus, when he heard, everybody say heard. He couldn't see Jesus. Nobody can see him in this room. There must be some power in what you hear. When he heard that Jesus Christ of Nazareth was there, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Then many warned him to be quiet. Do you see the warfare? He's begging. Jesus comes. He releases what he wants him to do. He's crying out. He's saying, God, come. And then the critics show up. You are going to have to get past what people think about your walk with Jesus if you're going to live for him for the rest of your life. Because here they come. They warned him, be quiet. Were they embarrassed? I don't know. Did they not believe in Jesus? I don't know. But they tried to silence him. Watch this. They warned him, be quiet. But he cried out all the more. Son of David, have mercy on me. So Jesus stood still and commanded him to be called. Then they called the blind man, saying to him, Be of good cheer, rise, he is calling you. Throwing aside his garments, he rose and came to Jesus. So Jesus answered and said to him, What do you want me to do for you? And the blind man said, Rabbi, that I might receive my sight. Then Jesus said to him, Go your way, your faith has made you well. And immediately he received his sight. And he followed Jesus on the road. Father, we ask you to help us for just a few moments as we dissect this word. God, there's an anointing in this room to see what we could not see. And I don't understand why you chose this topic today, Father, but I sense that some are going to have some blinders fall off their eyes in just a moment. And so, God, I ask you to rip them down in Jesus' name. God, I pray that the spiritual eye becomes the only eye. The one that is driven by Holy Spirit. 
And God, I pray that the eyes of the enemy would fall in this atmosphere right now. God, that the desires of the heart would quake right now under the presence of an awesome Jesus. God, that we would literally be the, we would see the veil pour, pull back, God, and we could step into a place of absolute freedom. That we could believe you for absolutely anything in this atmosphere, God. And our faith, God, not be challenged. God, once you show us your glory. In Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. How many, how many need a new eye on a couple of things in your life? Wave at me if I've got the right audience. You need to see differently for just a moment. I was thinking about this this morning, this week, and here's a couple of things that jumped out on me. When Jesus is about to move, he wants to move in an atmosphere. He wants to move on that thing. Now raise your hand again. You'd say, I've got that thing that I need a new perspective on. He's going to begin to press and show himself. But I want to I want to I want to make this clear before we deal with just three or four things that are very simple concerning this text. You've literally got to lay hold of the miraculous. Amen. You're going to have to lay hold of it. It's not just if it happens, it happens. You're going to have to literally spiritually reach out and say, God, I want that thing in my life right now, immediately. Like if you want to live for Jesus for real, you're going to have to reach out when the conviction comes. If you want to be convicted of that sin, listen, all the days of your life where it's not just a momentary, momentary conviction that leaves when you leave the room, then you've got to literally grab a hold and accept conviction on your life as a normal way of living. If you want faith to become normal, when God releases the gift of faith, I mean, it's been there, you can just believe for some reason you've got the faith and you've got to take that thing and say, this is the new normal in my life. I've had an atmospheric shift and a transformation from Jesus and I refuse to lose it to the hands of the devil. It's, I'm talking about this idea that Jesus is going to begin to come and not just question things in our lives, but challenge us to a higher level to see from another dimension and then you're going to have to accept it. Everybody say that's the hardest part because accepting it might mean that I can't have this friend in my life. Accepting it might mean my Facebook looks different. Accepting it means I can't be around naysayers anymore that don't believe in the power of God. I just cannot surround myself with individuals that cannot believe in the supernatural. See, Jesus, his atmosphere is supposed to trump every other atmosphere. It's supposed to trump your friendships. It's supposed to trump your parents. It doesn't matter who they are or how close they are to you. If they're speaking another language, they are seeing through a different eye. And when God puts a new eye in you to see his goodness, you need to stay there. How many ever saw the goodness of God and then you get someone around you that can't see the goodness of God and before you know it, you can't see the goodness of God? We're talking about seizing atmospheric transformation of Jesus Christ. What I love about blind Bartimaeus is it did not matter the atmosphere around him. He was going to have some transformation even if they didn't. He was going to see again if no one else even cared that he was blind. One of the traps of the enemy is to get you in an isolated boo-hoo where you can no longer seek the face of God because you're too busy at this place of just, you know what, poor me. Exchange your poor me for good God. Exchange your poor me for I'm serving a good God that does care about poor me when nobody around me cares about poor me. How many know what I'm talking about? There's a God who sticks closer than a brother. Come on. He's a father to the fatherless. And when he comes with an atmosphere, every time that atmosphere shows up called the presence of God, within that swirling atmosphere is the life of God, is the forgiveness of God, is the grace of God, is the power to break bondage type God that's in operation. That atmosphere is a whirlwind of his word that comes to literally eradicate the thing you're battling. Imagine God like an F5 tornado ready to blow away the thing you're struggling with, but you won't get into the tornado because you're afraid it's going to hurt a little bit. But the God we serve is not out to hurt you. He's out to heal you. And the way he heals you is to drive out the thing that's killing you. The atmospheric change is coming in your life so that you can see differently. Like, I don't have to be bound in that. I don't have to speak like that. I don't have to be negative all the time. I've got a new eye. 
I don't have to let my past define me anymore. I've got a new eye. Come on. I don't have to let my past define me anymore. I've got a new eye. I can see that the blood has taken my sin, thrown as far as the east is from the west, and he blotted out my transgressions, and in the sea of forgetfulness rests my sin, and I'm not going there to try to dig it up anymore. The God I serve has brought a new atmosphere, therefore I must seize it from now until the day he blasts the trumpet, and I defend the atmospheric shift and the transformation of Jesus Christ that occurs in my life. If you don't embrace it, grab it, and make it a reality, it becomes a temporary emotional fix. If someone was shot with a 45 caliber and we got the biggest band-aid we could possibly find and we strap it around that bullet wound, it's not enough. Temporarily, you may not see blood. While their organs are bleeding inter internally that you cannot see at all. Stop putting the band-aid on the bullet wound and get the atmosphere to come until it sets you absolutely free and then defend it for the rest of your life. And that's blind Bartimaeus. It doesn't matter the atmosphere. What I care about is the God who's setting me free. So I want, if you're taking notes, first thing I want you to understand is that Jesus Christ is coming to your situation. I know that sounds simple, but I want you to hear this. Listen, religion's not coming. A preacher's not coming. A prayer warrior's not coming. But Jesus Christ is coming. Here's what they literally they're going to they're going to Jericho and from Jericho. I love that that they're going to the city and coming out because Jericho's where the battle was. Come on. And so God's saying, I'm gonna go ahead and introduce myself on a battlefield. And then I'm gonna come out of that battle. Do y'all remember Jericho where the walls came falling down? When I get out of here, I'm coming up and I see this man that is blind, known as blind Bartimaeus. And watch this, he hears that Jesus Christ is here. Now I want you to understand something because Jesus Christ has been reduced to a name on a sign. He's been reduced to a great worship team. He's been reduced to great preaching. He's been reduced to bonded leather and ink on pages. My God, he's been reduced to all kinds of things. He's been reduced to whatever the cutest thing you could find on Facebook with your cutest scripture to say whatever you wanted to say. Jesus is bigger than social media. He's bigger than paperback, hardback, my God, your cell phone. Everything that you've created that makes this all Jesus. He's the God who sits on the circle of the earth. Earth. He holds the universe in the span of his hand. Where can we build a house for this awesome God? He's the image of the invisible God. He was the firstborn over all creation. Before man was even created, he would be the lamb that was slain before the foundations of the earth. God looked down the scope of time and knew that you and I would be wicked and he created a plan to deal with our problem. That's how awesome our God is. He is not intimidated by your sin. He's a God that's willing to strike that sin down, deliver you from it and set you free for all the days of your life but you must embrace the atmosphere of holiness stop repelling it you must embrace the atmosphere of healing and believe it I mean he's had someone say something to you before and it's created an atmosphere like you didn't lie but they say you're a liar You ever wish you could just shoot a storm? It's over. That's what I'm talking about right there. It's just, this atmosphere just comes and it starts tailoring. At first you're like, I can't believe they called me a liar. Then you start going down. Okay, I want to make sure I didn't lie here because I don't want to get struck by lightning. Then you do self-inventory. Right when you come to the realization, I didn't lie. They lied. 14 people believe you lied. It's like, here's this atmosphere. It's swarming. And now there's an accusation against you. But the word of God creates a new atmosphere that says who can bring a charge against God's elect for it is God who justifies. That there's a God in heaven that's written everything on this planet so I've got to lift my atmosphere higher and say hold up. It doesn't really matter what you think or what you say. What matters is what my God has done in my life and what he's recorded in heaven through angelic activity and he knows. Come on. He knows that he knows that he knows the truth of what happened and you've got to trust that atmosphere regardless of the atmosphere that you can see. That's one example of the world's atmospheres that will come like a tornado to redefine you. Amen? 
So here's what I want to say before we get it real deep into this. Jesus Christ is coming. He's not just coming back. He's coming into this room. He lives in you. He's on the outside of you. Someone say, how's he coming? He's in my heart. He's in your heart, outside of your heart too. Don't ever produce God to your little heart. Amen? Is he in your heart? Absolutely. Is he outside of your heart? Absolutely. Is he seated at the right hand of the Father? Absolutely. My God, is the earth is his footstool? Yes. My God, he's sitting back like the earth is a lazy boy. That's how big our God is. He's definitely not confined by your little heart. He's an awesome God. Which makes him bigger than any atmosphere that seeks to get you. So watch this. Who is this God that's coming? And I want you to understand this. Hebrews 11 says, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. So it doesn't matter what atmosphere you're in. You've got to trust that though you cannot see the evidence of the new atmosphere. Like if you've got an atmosphere of strife in your home. You've got to trust that though you cannot see the peaceful atmosphere yet. The evidence is not yet seen, but I trust that there's a bigger atmosphere that's coming by morning. This is why God says things like, your sorrow may last for the night, but you've got joy coming in the morning. There's an atmospheric shift that night season can happen for a certain amount of time, but then the God factor shows up. The God of breakthrough begins to manifest himself. And here's what I want to get you to see. That that atmosphere is the atmosphere you need to long for, pray for, believe for, and expect to be an operation in your life, regardless of what you're currently dealing with. Because if you just lay down in your current destructive atmosphere, that thing will send you as far as you allow it to take you how far will you allow detrimental atmospheres to literally determine your day let me give you an example boy they already made me mad about seven o'clock this morning i, mean, I ain't even had my coffee yet by nine you're stewing by noon you about rip somebody's head off by three their head's off by six, you're fired. <laughs> By nine, you're in a cop car. How many know how this thing works? So the atmosphere just keeps intensifying. Because you embrace the thing that the enemy sent. And if the enemy can wipe out one hour, he'll go for two. If he can wipe out your morning, he's going after your afternoon. If he's got your afternoon, he will move at the hour, which is in the evening time, and then he'll even interrupt your dream realm, because then you will dream according to the desires of your heart, and then you won't discern it, and you'll call it God. I had this dream. Yeah, you've been in the flesh all day. Of course you had a dream. The devil was dreaming with you. Don't blame it on God. I just had this dream that my whole family, because mm -hmm. you don't like them. And you tripped according to your own heart. You with me? It's like we want to get spiritual by morning about the dream when we've been in the flesh all day. I don't put much stock in flesh dreams. I'm just like, throw that one out. I was a bad boy. Atmosphere. I want you to understand it. Jesus Christ is certain by faith. We must understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God. Do you imagine? I want you to imagine all the billions of stars were named by God. And let me tell you something. These stars were named by a God who flung them into existence. Amen. You may think, how can every star have a name? Well, how can a God make a billion stars? Amen. Or billions? The same God that threw them into existence, he framed the worlds by the word of God. This is what I want to say to you. Your words determine atmosphere. We say it a lot. Death and life is in the power of the tongue. How many believe that? Death and life, you can kill a thing. You can tear down a person. You can rip them to the floor or you can build them up in about two minutes. It just takes me about ten seconds to dress someone down in the spirit and dress them up with courage. How many know it's true? You've got to be careful what you speak into an atmosphere. So instead of getting in your storm saying, yeah, it's just so awesome. Why don't you speak to your storm and say, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth to get up and go. I don't know what the future holds, but I know a God who holds the future in his hands. So I speak from another dimension to the thing that wants to wipe me out. Regardless of atmosphere, you can seize a new atmosphere. Are you with me? 
Listen to this. The things which are seen were made by things that were invisible. I want you to imagine this because you know, there's no way out of this. I mean, no one's ever going to believe me. I'm never going to be able to get past this. I'm never going to get a raise. I'm it's just impossible. The next person's in line. The list goes on with you just stewing your atmosphere. But the God I know only shows up when he can make something out of something that is invisible. In other words, when the circumstance has no answers in the natural and no natural way to fix it, God brews over that just like he did when there was no earth and he said, let there be. There was no heavens. He spoke them into existence. He joys making something out of nothing. He don't need a prerequisite. He don't need a favorite boss. My God, he don't need the doctor. He don't need anybody. He can do what he wants, when he wants, how he wants and speak it into an atmosphere. So we must align ourselves according to his atmosphere and seize the transforming atmosphere of Jesus Christ imagine that it wasn't like he made dirt out of dirt he didn't make stars out of stars he didn't make an earth out of earth he made earth out of nothing stars out of nothing dirt out of nothing the only thing he made out of dirt was you, which at that point, listen to this, I want you to understand this. He made an earth that gave him the ingredients. I told you when a man gets cremated, the amount of, the amount of components and value of all of the different metals that's in the human body is about $16.50. You mean I'm only worth 16 bucks. You better get saved. Because the Bible says there's a treasure within the earthen vessel. Come on, there's a treasure within the earthen vessel. It's called the spirit and the soul of a man. The most valuable thing you have is not your skin, not your body. It's a God that has literally activated your spirit, man, to get up and serve him all the days of your life. And your mind, will and emotions to be caught up to the plans of God. So hear this, out of nothing, he made everything. And then out of that something, he started making something. Do you think he has enough ingredients to change your atmosphere? You can go to the showroom floor of the most awesome Mercedes. And you're like, man, that is amazing. They did an awesome job with God's ingredients. Don't forget that they took all his metals from all his earth, shined it up with all his stuff that made all this stuff. Everything came from the earth. In his creation. This is why he says things like, I own all the cattle on a thousand hills. Okay, so we're, I want you to understand the atmosphere that we want to get into our lives. Come on, it's bigger, it's greater, it's much more promising. And, hear me, it's got a different language. It's got a different language. Here we go. Let's keep moving. Hebrews eleven six. Without faith, it's absolutely impossible to please God. You're like, man, I mean, I like the stars and the moon and all this stuff you're talking about. But now you're telling me if I don't have faith, I can't even please him. No, because without faith. But Jesus hasn't shown up. I don't see Jesus doing anything. You don't need to see anything. It's never been about your naked eyes. Do you believe he made the earth? You didn't see that. Do you believe he washed your soul and scrubbed it down and threw your sins into the sea of forgiveness? You didn't see that. You didn't see all your sins be airlifted off of your soul and body that was destroying you. The Bible says that even your sin will cause your bones to be destroyed and your body to begin to decay. I'm telling you right now, you didn't see God lift that burden off of you at an altar. You didn't see him turn on the tears in your soulish realm. You didn't see the activation of any of that. But was it true or not? Atmosphere is never about you seeing first. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. How many is hoping for a better atmosphere wherever you're at? Come on. It's what you're hoping for. The evidence. Come on. If you're on a crime scene, they want evidence. The evidence is not yet seen. The evidence of my miracle, and this is where the old school kind of grandmas of the faith, which I love dearly, have this thing right. They used to say things like, you know what? Jesus is my healer and I'm healed. So then we got so smart, we said, you can't be in denial. You're still sick saying you're healed. 
But really what they were saying was, is I'm going to trust in an atmosphere that I have not seen yet. I don't have the evidence in front of me, but that doesn't change the fact that my God is the God that healeth thee, and I'm claiming that atmosphere. What is so wrong with claiming an atmosphere you cannot see? Our theology has become, it's all that's done when we strip that away from the body is created in a, a theology of unbelief. Am I saying run around just name it and claim it and not believe it? Because no, you can get vocal about something you don't even trust. You sing songs sometimes, you don't believe, you can pray and not believe, and you can name it and claim it and blab it and grab it and not believe it. You can do all that without faith, which is why I'm saying without faith, it's impossible to believe, to, 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 it's impossible, what's this, to please a God who made everything by faith. Even you. He trusted that when he picked up dirt, he could form it. And how many know that takes some serious faith right there to know that when I pick up this dirt, I will form a human being and they will have every organ they need. And then I'll breathe the breath of life into them and they'll become a living, breathing nephesh. As soon as I breathe into them, this soul will become mobile because it'll have blood in operation for the life of the flesh is in the blood. And without the shedding of it, there's no forgiveness of sin. And he knew as soon as I breathe my life into this corpse, it will move. I'm eating to breathe into my corpse. <laughs> Me too. Why don't you just accept the atmosphere of heaven? We're talking about a place that you're never, you, you'll see the after effects. He says, wherever the wind blows, come on, the spirit's like the wind. Wherever it blows, you don't see the wind, but you see the effects of wind. Like if a crazy gust of wind, little microbursts come through here, it has the potential to start picking up trash cans, all kinds of stuff. And before you know it, those trash cans are at another address. And no one can say, I saw the wind. All you saw was the effects of its power. You are never going to see exactly how God takes organs while the surgeon's there and he don't know what to do, but he takes one last x-ray and something begins to change. I understand not every person on this planet has gotten healed, but you do not have the right to try to debunk the power of God's healing when he formed man from the beginning and he's still healing people across this entire planet. No one reserves the right to question an awesome God. Not me, not you, not anybody on this planet. He's a good God. 100% of the time. Listen to this. So here's some things. Number, number two, let me throw this at you. Number one, just Jesus is coming. Couldn't you be deeper? Uh-uh, because we ain't got it yet. Jesus is coming with a new atmosphere. Listen to this. Hear this. The Bible says he heard. Can you imagine blind, begging? Can't see, can't see anybody. You don't even know where to beg, but you're listening. I think I hear some people. Do you think, you said, I'm saying, can't see, still ask. He hears Jesus Christ is coming. He lights up like a Christmas tree. So you must hear that Jesus Christ is coming to your issue. You've got to hear it, not in your ear, but in your spirit, man. That there is another atmosphere for you. Now watch this. I'm going to show you. Here, here, here's the temptation. Listen to this. The atmospheric transformation is coming up on blind Bartimaeus. Here's what I love about him. He seizes it. To seize means to lay hold of very suddenly, very quickly, very violently. In other words, Jesus is here. I'm not about to miss my breakthrough. See, we have altars and Jesus is here and then we get hungry. Jesus is here. We got to go take care of this. You start praying in the morning. Jesus is here. The phone rings. Jesus is here. My God, text message. Jesus is here. A crisis shows up. All of a sudden, there's always those things that seek to interrupt the Jesus is here moment. When Jesus is here to blind Bartimaeus, he seizes the atmosphere immediately. I'm going to show you something. I love this about blind Bartimaeus. You know what he could have said? Could you give me some money, Jesus? I mean, I'm out here begging. I mean, I know you got money. You're God. 
Give me some money. Jesus. In the presence of Jesus, he could now see what he could not see before. That he had a need that was deeper than his begging moment. When he was begging, he could not ask anybody because it didn't matter how much money you gave him. No amount of money could open blinded eyes. No amount of money could open blinded eyes. So when he heard that a new atmosphere was here, that Jesus was in the atmosphere, that he was in the region, that he was coming near him, it literally triggered, triggered a new way of asking. And instead of saying, Lord, I want money, he starts crying out for a deeper need. And this is what I want to say to you this morning. When Jesus shows up in this atmosphere, stop asking for your surface things. The stuff you're asking everybody else for. Someone's like, could you pray for me? Could you pray for me? Could you encourage me? Could you encourage me? Jesus shows up. Could you pray for me? Could you encourage me? Well, my God, you ask human flesh for all that all the time. The beggar went from asking the money. Hold up. I've got a deeper issue here. I now have an opportunity to seize atmosphere. There's a God in the room that can make the blind see, the lame walk, the deaf hear, and the dead rise. He's still a God that does it across the earth. Whether you've gotten your breakthrough in that area or not, he still does it. And he holds the deed to this planet. I want you to imagine that in heaven, God holds the entire deed to this universe and he can orchestrate anything. When God don't do what we want sometimes, we start shrinking God in our minds. He must be little. You're taunting God and you're mocking God in your spirit. Don't you ever read your circumstance and shrink a God who made you. He's big when he does for you and he's big when he doesn't do for you. The mere fact that you're breathing air, he's worthy of praise. Let everything that has breath praise ye the Lord. Always, 24-7, 365. My trial does not determine my praise. He's good. Because listen, when it don't go your way, how many has been there? Come on, when it don't go your way and don't go the way you want it, how many know you still need God now? You still need your emotions healed. There's always a chance for the God factor to show up. But the day you kick him out, expect to be bound and bitter for a very long time. Because only God of heaven can strip out bitterness and remove the hatred and anger and unforgiveness that some even develop towards God when he does not respond the way they wanted him to. Got an opportunity here. Is God big? Yeah. Is he good? Yeah. Amen. Amen. In trials, is he good? Yes. I promise you need him in trials. Yes. That's right. You need him more. Yes. You need him more in the trial when you don't get your miracle than you did when you got your miracle. That's right. That's right. There's always a place for the atmosphere of heaven to come. I want you to hear this. So here's blind Bartimaeus. I want, I want you to imagine this. He's a blind beggar, no amount of money, no resources, nothing could change anything. And, and, and I felt like Holy Spirit spoke to me. He says, tell the people in a moment, I want them to start crying out from a chamber place of their heart in areas that they've never asked him to do something before. Maybe you asked him a long time ago and you didn't get it. But I want you to let out those things that man can't fix. Come on. Let out those things that emotions, none of this can fix. This atmosphere in the earth actually cannot fix the wounds of your childhood. Just cannot. You gotta have a new atmosphere. You gotta have God showing up. So I want you to start asking for some of those things in just a moment. You cannot be content in just receiving what man is able to do, even when God does what man is capable of doing. How many seen that before? Man could have walked up and get, you know someone you know could have blessed you financially, but they didn't. But God showed up supernaturally and did what man could have did. That's awesome. But there's then those things that no man can do. And that's the story we're talking about. No amount of money could give him sight back. No amount of money can make a person want to believe again when they're hurt and mad at God. Only the atmosphere of heaven can put faith back into a man that can't believe God anymore. 
Only the Holy Spirit can produce conviction in you when your mind has been seared as of a hot iron and you want to do right but you keep doing wrong and you keep living for this world. But only God can rip away the searing of the mind until you can hear God again. No one can counsel you to a place of conviction. Only the atmosphere of heaven can convict you in the courtroom of heaven and declare you guilty until you know that you're worthy of a penalty. But God shows up and places the payment for your penalty and says, do not give them a penalty. I have paid the price for their freedom. Only God can do that. Only the atmosphere of heaven. So I'm, I'm telling you there's some things we're going through that we keep looking to man. It's like I would love to have unlimited resources to shake a nation. I also know that about every preacher in this nation is praying for that one little old lady that's going to put them in their wheel. Well, the lady's going to go broke after all those preachers. There's not enough. And that one little old lady, we keep all praying for. <laughs> we need the God of heaven to come with resources that are supernatural to push kingdoms. Something bigger than one person. Are you hearing me? I'm here to literally cause you to see in your spirit things that you've really desired from God. And to see which you could not see before is the actual prayer he's wanting. And he's not afraid of. He's not afraid that you're mad at him. I'm going to say that again. He's not afraid that you're mad at him. He's not afraid that you feel like he hurts your feelings. He's not afraid of all the people that have betrayed you. And the effect that they've had on your life. He's not afraid to come and just begin to nurture the heart of it. As long as you'll ask him for what man can't do. Get ready for an atmospheric shift. I don't want God in that place. Listen to this. Blind Bartimaeus moved from being a beggar. A beggar of money. To crying out for a miracle. I want you to get that in your spirit. Some of you. Listen to this. Here's what I love about blind Bartimaeus. I want money, but I need to be able to see. Want me? All right, so I said he needed money too. I get it. And he wanted money. <laughs> Need and wants can go hand in hand. But sometimes you've got to shift from your want. Because if my eyes are open, I can probably go to work. That's the problem with government checks sometimes. Some people stay bound for 50 years because they don't want to give up the check. I'm praying for them. They're looking at me like I'm the foolish one, have no power, no anointing. I'm like, you just want the check. Don't blame it on me. Three people's laughing. <laughs> this is real. Are you understanding this? Is there anything wrong with the check? No. But I'm just saying, if Jesus heals you, are you willing to be honest? That a new atmosphere hits your life and you can get up and walk and you can function properly because the power of God hits your life. Blind Bartimaeus wasn't over here saying, don't heal me because then I can't beg anymore. Forget the begging. My God, I want to see because I've never seen anything before. And he wanted to see what he could not see before. How many still want that type of breakthrough from God where you can see what you could not see before? There's a difference here from wants and needs. And if you'll get to that deep chamber of your heart, God loves those cries. He loves those cries. We're almost done here. I want you to hear this. Listen to this. So I, I, I'm going to skip through a couple things because I want, I, want, I want to really, I want you to catch this. So, number two, number one, Jesus is here. Listen to this. Number two, you've got to get to that place that meant in just a moment when we have the worship team, I have a need. I don't want to be this way. I don't want to be full of hatred. I don't want to be full of anger. I don't want to be addicted. I don't want to be, get to the need. Stop the plastic Christianity. We're not called to be cute little plastic action figures. That paints on the face. And then changes it. Just get to the need. 
I'm hurt. I'm wounded. I'm mad. I don't have any un I don't have any belief in my life. I'm full of unbelief. I'm not trying to put things on you that are not, are, are not on you, but if it triggers something in you, my God, get it out and let Jesus come and a new atmosphere come. You're just going to have to deal. Some of the reasons why people cannot get a hold of Jesus is because they won't ask for the very thing they need. They can't even get saved because they don't believe that they really even need it because they're just so precious. Precious people burn in hell. I hate to make the announcement. We have a need. And we have a God. That supplies all of our needs. I'm looking for truthful altars this morning. Amen. Watch this. I want you to hear this. Here he goes. Um, he gets to this place. And I was thinking about this. Where. He tries to let it out. How many would feel humiliated if in a moment we just start crying out? We're just like, God, I got this need. I mean, the altar's going, my God, the piano zinging all through you. All that stuff we do. And you're saying, and someone walks over to you right in this church. Bob, be quiet. First of all, I'm going to have another need. <laughs> you see how quick the flesh went up? So I don't even know how he did it. And the Bible, I'm just like, what? I thought we were at church. <laughs> and they're looking at the hand like, yeah, I thought we were at church. I know, but I thought we did. Anyways, so you're at this place. I want you to hear me. You start crying out and someone in this room just shuts you down. That was blind Bartimaeus. He hears Jesus and he starts crying out. And he's like, man, I got this need. And everybody's like warning him, you better be quiet, man. Be quiet, be quiet. It could have been out of embarrassment. It could have been a cultural thing. It doesn't matter. He was being silenced. And I want to say to you, the very thing that you need, your family has sought to silence you. You've got family members that are like, you know what? I don't even know if God's going to do that. I don't know if you need that. Blah, 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 blah. Hush. They are attempting to silence you. Family members will silence you. Christians will seek to silence you. Backsliders will silence you. I've seen backsliders that start trying to start a theological debate with me. I'm like, first of all, get saved again. And then let's talk about baptism in the Holy Spirit. Let me tell you a story. I got time? I'm not a big storyteller. I was in the gas station the other day in Arizona. Just wearing my little Wake of the Dawn t-shirt. I wasn't thinking anything, you know, just coming out. This man, he says to me, he goes, Awake in the Dawn. I mean, did, did y'all gather a lot of people? And I was like, well, you know, you know he said, did y'all gather a lot of people all over the world? I said, no, I was just in Santa Fe. He's already got this, like, world vision. I'm like, who is this guy? So anyways, he, 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 he goes, like, man, that's awesome. I said, yeah, we did worship and prayer. And it was awesome. Very just casual. He walks out. And here comes the skeptic, the silencer. And I'm coming out, he's like, what do you think God thinks of all the extinct animals? <laughs> I'm like, er? I had a spiritual whiplash right there. I'm just like, man, I was in the spirit until I met you. Now my neck's hurting. Just like that, not hello. I said, he made every one of those animals and he knew each one of them would be dead. <laughs> Some of you are like, I just got my feelings hurt right there. I'm just telling you my response. He dropped a few F-bombs in the conversation. I'm like, okay. And he goes, I just struggle with this whole thing. You know, you probably believe in heaven and hell. And he, he just starts going on because I'm a geologist. You don't understand the things that I've seen. I said, everything you've ever seen, God made. Amen. Amen. Now we're in conflict. Do you see what I'm saying? Because the word of God is confrontational. I'm thinking, man, okay, I hope I get to preach, but I might have to drop him in the next three or four seconds. <laughs> I'm like, I'm about to get in the flesh here. The geologist just rolled up on me. <laughs> Anybody ever have a flesh moment? I'm just... <laughs> if I don't tell you I'm human... <laughs> I'm... He keeps 
going. That's what he says to me. He's just going the whole thing. And he just can't get it. He has some good born again Christian friends. And they live this good life or whatever. And I just don't believe in it. I just don't believe in God. But let this happen. And we've got all these dumb people that are destroying the earth. And this. he's just going. And he goes, you know what? I'm going to make a deal with you. And I said, okay. Let's have this conversation again. Because I promise you, you're not right on this. I want to have this. Con I'm thinking he's going to give me his phone number. He goes, I want to have this conversation again when we're both dead. Oh. Everybody say atmosphere. I, I needed an atmosphere of heaven to come on. And it just came out of my mouth, I promise. You ready? I said, we won't be having this conversation when we're both dead because I'm going to be dancing with Jesus and you're going to be burning in hell so we can have the conversation again. Unless you choose Jesus Christ as the way, the truth, and the life, no one will come to the Father unless they go through him. Complete silence. It was like an atomic bomb just hit the store right there. He turned around and he just walked off and it was just like... I don't know if this is effective witnessing. I'm just telling you that sometimes... You need the atmosphere of heaven to come. And that's all I can think of. Y'all mad at me? I'm trying to confess my sins among my brethren. Working in my sermon there. Here's what I felt like the Lord spoke to me as soon as he walked off. If he has one, here's it. This is what the Lord spoke. One atmosphere from heaven changes everything. The Lord began to speak to me. I was walking away. He says, that man has literally filleted people alive because of his geological understanding. But he could not face the simple reality of the cross and eternity and being separated from the living God. The clear gospel of Jesus Christ still silences your adversary. When someone comes to silence you, like blind Bartimaeus, he cried out forevermore. And that's what I felt from that moment. I've got to cry out forevermore that the God I serve is still bigger than anything that any geologist has ever studied. He made the universe and he will separate man from him unless you choose Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior of your life. That's what I got out of it. I didn't see everything went right. I said, you got to learn to seek God alone. That's what I want to say to you. Blind Bartimaeus was alone. The best atmospheres of heaven you'll come, that will come on your life will be alone. Stop waiting for people to rally you, encourage you, dream for you, tell you you're the greatest thing since toilet paper. It's not going to happen. They're not going to encourage you. No one is going to really help you except for what the body of Christ is supposed to be. And we haven't done a very good job of that. So you know what? The best thing i got right now is me and Jesus Christ on my face. Because you've got to learn how to serve him and seek him alone. This is the problem with Bible colleges sometimes. Even when revivals have broken out, they start chapels and these students come and they go because they want to be great for God. And they know how to find God in that little, that, that infused atmosphere of fire. Everybody's praying. Everybody's laying hands on the sick. They want to go to this school of the supernatural, that school of the supernatural. And they've got a structured way of meeting God. You've got to be at chapel at nine. You've got to read your Bible this amount of times. You've got to do this. And it's all awesome. But here's the problem. If they don't take the discipline with them, one naysayer shuts them down in one moment because they're not in a bubble of encouragement all the time. Blind Bartimaeus was not in a bubble of encouragement. No one wanted his sound, but he wanted to see. And so he released a sound that was far greater than what he could see, and then a few moments later he could see. That is the power of God. You've got to seek Him when no one will help you seek God. That's God. You and God alone sometimes. How many's had them before that don't believe that? You can't believe that. That's not going to happen. Time for some alone time. Amen. Here's some things I, I, I felt like the Lord spoke to me. People will want to silence you. Facebook will want to silence you. I've had videos just pulled down. I'm like, what? What just happened? I thought we were all praying at the capitals, nowhere to be found. <laughs> Facebook's not your friend. Twitter's not your friend. 
Like on all the social media is not our friend. Emojis are not your friend. I love it when I get the hand praying signs. I'm like, are you really or is that an emoji? I'm trying to figure this out here. Just... Does the hands replace the God-seeking time? Does the smile cover up your... I mean, there's emoji lies all over the place. And then that brown one shows up. That's how this thing works. We need God. I'm telling you guys. We need an encounter. I'm sorry. Some of you are like, he's done quenched it. He's got no anointing today. I just can't handle this. I'm starting a joke thing. Stick around long enough. I might not tell one joke next week. I might just have the straight Rambo look. So come back. <laughs> denominations will seek. Watch this. Denominations will seek to silence you. I love our fellowship. I'll say this publicly because I've said it to them. I'll be with the assembly of God as long as the assembly of God allows and empowers me to be everything God called me to be. When you stick a noose around my neck, I don't want to be a part anymore. Amen? Amen? We are here to be led by Holy Spirit, not controlled by man. There's one form of control in the church, and it's self-control. It's a full-time job. Amen. But denominations at times can seek to silence you. You've got to have a blind Bartimaeus in you that says, regardless of atmosphere, a new one's coming. Listen, regardless of my current atmosphere, a new one is coming Amen. at any moment. I want you to know, how many members Zacchaeus goes up along tree and encounters God. Woman with the issue of blood. He she presses through the cloud. No one's helping her. No one's pushing her. No one's saying, come on, we got to make it to Jesus. You got this blood issue for years. So you just press them through all alone. She could care less about everybody else's needs right now. So the issue of blood needs to stop immediately or I'm going to die. And she fights her way to the presence of Jesus, grabs the hem of his garment, and virtue and power left him. And immediately she was set free. That's the part of us I want us to activate this morning that says my need matters. My issue is killing me. And I need God. Nicodemus is like, man, y'all are like some theo theological gurus. I don't understand all this. We call it Nick at night. He shows up at night. He's going to talk to Jesus. Jesus, tell me about this thing. You got to be born again. You mean I got to go back into mama's womb? Don't, don't get crazy on me. You already came out of mama's womb. You need to be born of the spirit. Why didn't he come at daytime? Sometimes them alone, so you call it fear, call it whatever you want. But those alone times with Jesus silences the silence. Let me say it like this. It silences the silencing atmosphere that wants to stop you. Alone times. Here's the last one. I want you to grab hold of this number four. He calls unto Jesus until Jesus calls unto him. I don't know about you, but I, I want to get past this like, Jesus, will you? Jesus, will you? Jesus, will you? I want Jesus to say, son, come here. <laughs> I mean, this gets old. Will you do? Will you do? I bind, cancel, destroy. We do it all. I expect something destroyed when I say the name of Jesus. Come on. We've got to get back to when we believe that our letdowns don't define us anymore, though it wasn't God that let you down. And so I want whoever can come with, you know, I need worship team right now, however y'all want to do this, but I want you to hear this for just a moment. The Bible says in verse 49, blind Bar Bartimaeus, when the criticism came, when the silencing came, he cried even louder. How many know that takes a lot of courage? Because some people haven't silenced you, but now your voice is just a whisper. I've seen it in churches. Like radical prophetic dancers before the Lord. It just takes one crazy to go shut them down. And then they don't feel comfortable anymore. And the atmosphere is just like, well, y'all don't want it. It just takes one tongue to shut down before a church becomes a church of no tongues at all. I came to wage war against the silencing spirit. Until there's a freedom. Because the day we dance with a silencing spirit is the day we're producing strange fire in the earth. We might have a little bit of enthusiasm, but we don't have the manifestation of God's power. I was in the tent in Santa Fe. This lady, she was walking around giving prophetic words to everybody. I'm like, does this lady really have a word for everybody? 
Literally, that's what I thought. Because it was like everyone was getting one. So I started testing. I'm like, what's she saying? They're like, she said this and it was right. I mean, she had about 30 of them. 